Um, I am Cindy Sundell, and uh, I am with the Petit Institute for Bioengineering Bioscience, which are, is one of the sponsors for this uh, seminar series. And uh, it is my pleasure to uh, introduce, oh, before I, before I do that, um, can we go back one slide? Sorry, Christina. Um, today's uh, talk is going to be on FDA strategy, uh, pathways, options, and timing. And uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, next slide, please. I just wanted to remind everybody of some of the upcoming uh, seminars that uh, we have. Uh, the next one is March 17th uh, on quality management systems. And uh, next slide, please. And it is my pleasure to introduce um, our speaker for today, uh, Richard DeManda. He is back by popular demand. Uh, this uh, Richard also gave a similar um, uh, lecture last year in this series. Uh, Rich has over 30 years of medical device and commercialization experience uh, from a variety of um, public and private medical companies, and as well as new medical and health IT ventures. Uh, he has uh, executive management experience uh, as well as hands-on experience with regulatory uh, FDA PMA and 510K clearance, uh, clinical research, reimbursement, product management, and marketing. He's currently the founder of two startup companies and he teaches part-time for the Tiger program, uh, which is part of the Scheller College of Business. He's also served as a mentor uh, for ATDC, TechSquare Labs, and CreateX. Rich has a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from Villanova University a master's in biomedical engineering from Drexel, and an MBA from the Keller Graduate School of Management in Chicago. Uh, and uh, we're um, very honored uh, to, we're very honored to have uh, Rich with us today. And um, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Rich, but before we do that, I just wanna say, if you have any questions, we would really love it if you would put your questions in the Q&A section, we'll be monitoring that. And, um, uh, and you know, so that would be great if you could do that. So I'm um, handing it over to you, Rich. And you're on mute to so unmute yourself. Okay, there. off to a good start. <laughs> All right, I think I'm gonna share my screen now. We'll see if uh, everyone can see that. Um, And okay, looks good. Does it look all right? Yes, thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you so much, Cindy, for that um, kind introduction. And um, I'm going to talk to you uh, today primarily about regulatory, but I guess I'd like to start off by mentioning that it's extremely important that you realize regulatory is only one part of making a successful commercialization effort. Um, I'm going to advance to the next slide now here. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. Um, surprisingly, I've worked over my 30 plus years in over 18 fields of medicine. And you might think I know a lot about medicine. I don't. Uh, the funny thing is, what I realized I have learned over the years is the really important questions to ask to make a successful commercialization effort. So the thing that I'm gonna to try to begin to teach you uh, today is all the questions to ask and also to give you a new vocabulary, okay? Uh, it'll have to do a lot with regulatory sorts of stuff. And as I was saying, um, it's pretty important to um, realize that everything has to mesh and work together. Otherwise, nothing works. And today we're gonna to focus on regulatory, but I do wanna say that for researchers, it's particularly important to be working on what I call the right thing. And the right thing is something that will be able to be successfully commercialized. Um, I've often found that academic uh, inventors can sometimes get very excited when they um, 
come up with a what they call a platform technology, you know, um, and a platform technology is something that could be applied to many different applications. The problem with that is it works in favor of the academic incentive reward system, meaning try it for this, publish, try it for that, publish, try it for this, publish. The trouble is you got to pick something to work on and focus on it in order to actually commercialize it and make it available and translate it from, as they say, bench to bedside. So that's one of the things that's important uh, to do if you're in academia and you're invented something is to think about focus and prioritization if you have an interest in commercializing something. We're also gonna talk heavily today about regulatory and clinical. If I have time, we'll talk a little bit about reimbursement, but the basic talk I've put together that covers the market and understanding the value proposition uh, is in a uh, video series that I'll reference in a minute. So you don't have to take notes today. I would just sort of sit back and, and take it all in best you can. Yeah, the dollar sign just came up. <laughs> That's because if the, the gears aren't lubricated with money, then also not much is gonna happen commercially. So um, I like to kind of um, simplify what is a very intimidating topic. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna give you some uh, kind of blunt advice here about why you shouldn't be overwhelmed by it. And I'm gonna teach you how to kind of master it pretty quickly, or at least come up with a preliminary regulatory strategy all by yourself. It's not that hard. So one of the main differences between yourself who might be not so familiar with all this stuff and a, a regulatory affairs professional is that frankly, that person knows how to use the FDA's website. Everything you want to know or need to know is on that website. I'd say close to 80 to 90% of what you need to know is on there. It's very rich with information. The trouble is the website's horrible and there is no way, unless you get very experienced, you can find anything on there. And so I'm going to teach you how to find stuff without having to use the FDA's search engine. And I'll document how horrible it is in one of my upcoming slides. So what we're going to do today is uh, uh, kind of give you the, uh, a dummy's guide, <laughs> what I call. And um, the, the first step is to kind of, and I mean this uh, euphemistically, uh, you know, to unlearn kind of something you were taught in school. And, and that is, the goal of figuring out what your regulatory strategy is, is to plagiarize someone who has done something very similar to you. And as you might have heard this quote, to steal from one person is plagiarism, to steal from many is research. And that's what I'm going to try to teach you how to do and how to find out what other people have done. Um, so what you do in general is seek to find a company or people to help you who have gone down the exact same path that you're going to have to travel. And it sounds very simple. Um, and it's actually, it's a matter of learning how to dig for information that will let you understand what someone else had to go through. It turns out that if you are working on a certain disease, you were gonna to have to do what somebody else did who worked on that disease. The FDA is not gonna cut you a break, typically, okay? So that's kind of a general rule. The other thing that's a little bit weird to get uh, sort of in your head is when you're giving a presentation to a venture capitalist or an investor, you're trying to say to them, I have patented this, it is so unique, it's so novel. Well, you want to do the exact opposite. 
when it comes to talking with the FDA. You want to be me too. You want to say, my thing is exactly like that other thing you approved. So please approve my thing. Okay. And this is a mindset that is a little difficult, especially if whatever you think you've invented is novel. The more novel it is, the more truly novel it is, the more trouble you got. The more you can argue that it's the same as somebody else's, the easier time you're gonna have. So as I was saying earlier, I made a series of five modules that are on the Georgia CTSA website. They're a little hard to find, but they're there. And um, what you can do is you can listen to, to these little videos. The whole thing takes about 40 minutes and it covers quite a bit of ground. First, it talks about why you as a researcher should pay attention to some of the things we're talking about today because it can help you more efficiently direct your research to things that could be useful later. For example, if you invent your own animal study and aren't aware of the animal studies that are done typically for a device or a drug, you're gonna to have to redo it. So it's a good idea to learn again what someone else has done and, and, and do that. Secondly, uh, second module is about regulatory. The third is about clinical trials. And the fourth will touch on digital health. We're gonna go through those three items pretty readily today. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to talk you through the reimbursements, but you can also listen to that. It uh, only takes about 10 minutes. Okay, so let's begin. Well, there's a very long history associated with uh, drug regulation. And the reason why we have regulations is laws were passed. Why? Bad behavior. It's kind of why we maybe need to pa pass a law on masks now, you know? People behave badly. And many years ago, you know, people would drive around in uh, wagons and, and, you know, try to sell all kinds of stuff. and. I don't know, these may just be some joke slides, okay? I don't know if any of this is real, especially this one here from the Soda Pop Board of America, where they're encouraging uh, children to uh, drink Coca-Cola earlier. Um, but there certainly was stuff like this, where uh, you know people prov pro provided claims that uh, certain drugs or agents could have a certain clinical benefit. Well, when I was researching uh, this uh, and, and this talk, um, I kind of stumbled on this uh, particular advertisement and um, it, it was in Popular Mechanics and uh, you know, I thought this was pretty interesting. Guy basically puts a lampshade on his head with a light bulb and claims he can, he can uh, grow hair, right? So, you know, I mean, it's a little tough to believe. And this this would be illegal now. In the 50s, pe people could do things like this and no one would say anything. So um, it turns out that starting around the mid 1800s, there was trouble bad drugs and other things got imported into the country. And finally, Congress decided to pass some laws. But strangely, it took over 50 years for the FDA to be formed, just to show you how long it takes for things to get themselves sorted out. And I'm not gonna go through every blow by blow of how the regulations evolved, but let's just say it got increasingly more complicated. And I would say the really serious requirements that represent the professional type of research that should be done today really hit in the, in the late 50s and early 80s. Since then, not too much has really changed. And the medical device amendments only came on board in 1976. Look at that, 70 years after the first formation of the agency. And that's because medical devices weren't the big problem or the big fear that was associated with drugs. So I've spent most of my time on 
medical device type uh, of uh, applications, some drug device applications as well. Um, and I'm gonna teach you now some vocabulary. And once you know this vocabulary, you'll be able to converse and impress people at cocktail parties, even though we don't have cocktail parties anymore. Maybe someday soon we'll have them again. So medical devices are classified into actually four different areas now. Uh, uh, the first one is my favorite one, it's class one. And that's for pretty simple devices that are unlikely to hurt somebody or are well understood like, you know, sutures and, and scalpels and simple uh, lumber simple medical devices. The only thing you have to do if your device is a class one device is send the letter to FDA that you're forming a medical company and create a quality management system. That's it. There's no interaction required with the agency. Now you might get inspected and therefore you'd better have the quality management system or the good manufacturing practice system put together. And I understand you're gonna learn about that at the next session uh, that, that'll be provided in a couple of weeks. So that's all that's required. Class two is more complicated, but the new word for you to learn is the word predicate. If you're in a class two, your goal to stay in class two, which is less strenuous than class three, is to find a device that's very similar to yours and claim that as your predicate. And I'm gonna talk about what that really means in a minute. Uh, now, it turns out that after 10 years went by, maybe in the, in the early 90s, uh, FDA decided they had classified too many devices into class two. So they moved them into class one. So there are many class two devices out there that have been moved into class one. And you need to pay attention and make sure you don't overexert yourself. The nice thing about class two is if it's similar enough to another device that's been approved, you might not have to do any clinical work. You might just be able to do bench work. Um, and, and, and if it's similar, sometimes clinicals are needed, okay? Especially if they made the other guy do clinicals, they're likely to make you do clinicals. Okay, the third class, which is where I wound up spending the, the early years of my life, <laughs> is the most painful class. This is like drugs. It's very serious and it's a lot of work. And it's for things that are totally new. Now, the difference between drugs and devices is that with devices, you usually can do one trial and you're done. You can start off with a, a small pilot trial and then roll that into a pivotal trial and you're done. With drugs, because they're more scary and they don't know what the longer term effects are, they push you to do three trials phase one, phase two, and phase three. So it's more complicated. But with devices, it's just one trial, but you gotta do the right trial and you have to be successful in meeting your endpoints. The other classification is I'm not a medical device, okay? <laughs> and uh, there's an interesting history about this I'm gonna go through and it, it encompasses all of this digital health related applications that are out there and or, or what they call clinical decision guidance and assistance, you know, things that are supportive of helping people make decisions. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And, and that's very popular right now as well. But generally, it's not a medical device. And you need to learn how to distinguish between those in a second. Another term for your vocabulary that's very important is the term substantial equivalence. I've used this term many, many times to prove that what I'm doing is similar or nearly identical to something that somebody else has done. And here's the definition of it, okay? And when you try to locate a predicate for a class two device, you want to find a device that is both been used for a very similar indication or a similar application medically and 
it has similar technological characteristics, okay? Uh, and if the technological characteristics are different, just so long as they don't raise any new scary questions of safety or effectiveness, they may let you slide. It doesn't have to be totally perfect, but generally they like things that are smack on. The degree to which it might not be smack on is the degree to which you might have to do some animal and clinical work, okay? So predicate, substantial equivalence. Now you got two words you can use to impress people with, okay? You know what they are. There's nothing much else to learn about it. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is take this situation, this particular medical device and use it. Uh, and, and the reason I, I got so interested in it is uh, I, I tracked down that this was not a joke, but was a real guy. Um, and his name was uh, uh, Murky, which I, I thought was a joke initially because I figured Murky, you know, maybe that's sort of a, a pun. But this was a real guy. This device that, that I, I, I'm showing you now, it's in a museum in Maine. And it was something that was made available. And you could see here, it's basically a lampshade. And then you plug this thing into the, into the lamp. You know, it's like a bulb. So how, how crazy is that? Well, I had interest in this because despite what I look like now, if you can see my video is I used to have a lot of hair. So I've become, you know, a little concerned about that. And this, this captured my imagination. This is my wife who looks pretty similar today as she does back then. Um, anyway, much to my amazement, I was on an airplane and I opened up an airline magazine and I saw two ads and I could not believe it. They were for laser hats, okay? And I, at first I thought, well, this is crazy. But then I see FDA cleared clinically proven. I couldn't believe it. So what I'm going to show you is how I researched everything there is to know about what these companies did to get clearance, because this is how you can figure out what your strategy needs to be. You need to follow what someone else has done. So we're going to use this as an example today. And you two new best friends for doing research is Google and a federal website called clinicaltrials.gov. And I'm gonna show you how to use these. As I mentioned, if you go on the FDA's website and type something into the search engine, you can forget about getting a good answer. And I'll show you how that works or doesn't work. But if you go into Google and you use the Google search engine and you type in the correct terms, which I will tell you what terms to use, it will dive bomb you into the correct spot of the FDA's website and voila, you'll have the information you need. So I'm gonna teach you how to do that. The other great site is, is clinicaltrials.gov. That is probably one of the best things that the federal government ever did and I'll explain why. So if you take the Google search engine and you type in, which I did up here, you can see, FDA clearance, hair max. I wrote the actual company's name in here. And here's what I got. I got all these entries. And of course, if you wanted to buy it, you could spend 3,000 or 1,000. Uh, if you go on Alibaba, you can buy one for $79. But what's interesting is, was, is these kind of entries here that relate to the FDA. And I'm gonna show you this one here, the 510K summary. So this is a section of what's available once you dive into the FDA's website, this is available. And this product was approved initially in 2011. And you can see here that they did a, whoops, sorry. They did a randomized double blind controlled trial, I mean, I'm gonna make some comments about this in a minute, but nonetheless, they actually did some work. The useful thing about diving into the 
summary, which is available publicly and on the internet readily, is you can learn things. For example, one of the things you can learn is who their regulatory person was. So in this case, Charita James was their regulatory consultant. consultant. She obviously doesn't work for the company, okay? That's good. You might wanna hire that person. Why? They've taken this company down that road and they have a lot of knowledge, okay? Sometimes the, the 510K submissions and other, you can, the same thing with the PMAs. You're gonna find, be able to find these kind of documents. So now if you click on another one, uh, the pre-market notification, that will actually take you directly inside the FDA's website. So now we're inside the FDA's website. And um, as you can see here, um, you can see now, okay, the hair max, they must have at some point, sorry. They must have shifted to this guy. He, this is the regulatory consultant now. And I actually invited Ed Basile many years ago to come to an educational program. He used to be the head of the FDA's Bureau of Medical Devices, uh, Radiological Health and Medical Devices, okay? So it's very helpful. You can see who the regulatory people were and potentially hire them. Most of the time, they're long past this client and they have no conflict of interest to work with you. Also, you can get, when you type in the name of the company, you can get their 510K number. And I'm gonna to refer to another thing you can do with that 510K number in a minute. But you also learn what the classification product code is. So all medical devices wind up in some kind of classification code that is three letters long. And it's a, it's a category of product for which different requirements might pertain. You need to know that. And it'll tell you what you have to do, okay? In this case, this device was a, a 510K and you can also click on this uh, underlined summary and you can, you can get at uh, information that's in a table on the FDA's website. A little different than the other document I, I talked to you about. Now, someone asked last time, how do you select a good regulatory affairs consultant? So I thought I'd put together a little slide. Well, one way you do it is what I've been you know, referring to. Uh, look on the prior submission of a predicate device and see who did it. And what you want to do is find someone who has gone down that path already, exactly. Because they're gonna know more than just the protocol and kind of generally what to do. Um, so that's what I, I try to strive to do is find someone that went down the path. Um, also, it's great if they went down the path, they will have interacted with the FDA staff in the particular review department. That's important because knowing the quirks and the personality orientation of the reviewers is an asset that a knowledgeable regulatory affairs consultant will have, somebody that's interacted with them already. And let me tell you, there's wildly different people that, that work in the agency. Some have no knowledge <laughs> and others <laughs> have a lot of knowledge. So it's good if you know who you're talking to. I think it's good for a regulatory affairs consultant to have a good science background, but very, and more important, is they have to be able to write and edit because their main job is to help you who have to really fill everything out, write clearly. The reason for writing clearly is if you write poorly, it'll generate a question. And you do not want questions to come back from the agency, a question, requires a response. Every question they ask you, you have to respond to. And until you are the recipient, as I have been, of a 10-page letter from the agency, which took me three months to respond to, 
you know that it's important to write very clearly. So that's the role a regulatory affairs person can help you with, with is make sure you're writing clearly and make sure you're saying the correct things. The other thing I like to do is when you write your submission, don't assume the reader's an expert. You got to write very simply and clearly. The other thing I like to do is maybe the regulatory affairs person has previously worked for your competitor. Hire them. It doesn't get any better than that. I was working on a product that I invented from the ground up at a company and a similar product for a similar indication was already cleared. I hired the person who used to work at that company. And let me tell you, they bring with them the submission. <laughs> it doesn't get any better than having someone who actually knows what the submission was. And I'm gonna show you how you can get someone's submission in a second. Okay, similar to, to, to regulatory is, is clinical. How do you hire a CRO? Well, you know what? It's the same, it's the exact same criteria. In addition, do they know sites that will enroll well? You know, some sites are poor. Sometimes people wanna be in a trial, but they enroll very poorly. You want good enrollers. Does the CRO know anything about how to help market the trial to patients or to referring physicians? If they do, you want that, that CRO. And also, did they take a trial all the way through FDA submission and clearance? Because then they'll know what data tables the agency likes and you'll know how to prepare your submission better. That is what I call domain related value added knowledge. And it's very important, otherwise, you bumble around. And if you make the wrong data table, the agency will write you back after you make your submission and say, we reviewed this and you need this table. And once they ask you a question when you've made your final submission, it can, it can result in a 60 day delay in, in, in getting, getting a response back after you send it in. So very important to use knowledgeable people. Okay. Back to, um, now there was a couple of questions that I see popping up here. I don't know if you want me, Cindy, to wait or. Um, uh, it's, up to, it's up to you, Rich. Um, yeah, you can take some now. Fortunately, I, well, wait, maybe I can. Oh my God. Some of them, oh, maybe. All right, I don't think I can. Well, this thing is like uh, somebody wrote a, uh, you know. <laughs> All right, forget that one. <laughs> <laughs> it's like somebody wrote a treatise here. Judd, we'll, we'll get to you uh, at the end, Judd. Okay. <laughs> we'll let you. Okay, now I got to get out of this. Okay. I'm going to just continue. We'll try to get it to it at the end. Okay, so back to the, the tables that are inside the FDA's uh, website that you can dive yourself into. Uh, here, here's another one. And, you know, like I said, you can click on the summary page. And the other great thing is, if you can get, uh, you know, sometimes companies are not that bright and they actually publish what the predicates were. So if you wanted to make a uh, hair growth device, for example, well, this one company, they, they, they like, look at this. They listed all these predicate devices, the Raydu and Wonder Brush. I love this, okay? How serious can these things be? Anyway, um, a good place to find predicates is what did the competitor use for their predicate? You don't have to invent this stuff. The idea with regulatory is not to be creative. Figure out what the other guy did, okay? Now, here's another thing that, that you can do with Google. If you use the Google search term, FDA clearance for laser hair growth devices, boom, you get all the FDA clearances listed here, you click on this and you can get all that information that I was just showing you from the, the, the hair comb. 
Now, by contrast, if you type FDA clearance hair max on the FDA's website, you would think you'd get, it would like zoom right in on that clearance. No, you get 50 crummy entries that leads you nowhere. So again, the website for whatever reason has a tremendous amount of valuable information, but you're not gonna find it easily unless you sort of use this technique. Now over time, you know, you'll get more familiar and you'll start to learn how to use the website, but it's not easy to use. And that's uh, one of the big obfuscation issues that I've had with the whole FDA business. Uh, once you learn what things mean, you're an expert. So uh, try to rely on yourself. Another really helpful thing is depending upon what you're working on, the agency might have published a guidance document, okay? These are really helpful. When companies submit multiple submissions, it turns out that they'll say, you know, look, we've gotten a bunch of these submissions. We've told five people the same thing. Why don't we write a guidance document? The guidance document is very specific. It tells you what you have to do to get clearance. So if there's a guidance document, you want to search it out. And you can do that on Google <laughs> using the search engine, FDA guidance document, whatever. Write the topic down and you'll find it. Now, this is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, as you might know, FDA submissions can be requested through the Freedom of Information Act, but it's a painful way to get it because usually you have to wait about two years before anybody will respond. However, there's a company called FOI Services. And if you take the K number, like let's say you type the K number into this search engine on their website, and I did that for the Hairmax laser comb, for $665, you can get 418 pages of their submission. You know, this is very helpful. Now, I have to qualify this by saying, sometimes the company will, they have the right to white out or what they call redact information that's in their submission that they consider to be proprietary. But they can't redact the headings of all the things they did. And they can't legitimately redact a lot of it. So it's very, it's very helpful. One time I bought one of these and the people were not very bright. They didn't redact anything. I had everything. The entire quality management test, the validation test, I had everything. This is how you get smart. And this is how you get smart fast, okay? And knowledgeable. So I would urge you to do this even if it is redacted. The other thing I love about this is it gives you all the correspondence that the company had with the agency. And you can also learn how they were hammering them, like what all their ugly questions were. That can be very helpful to you as well. Okay, let's move on a little bit to clinical uh, study design, which is a very important part of typically your regulatory process. Um, so like I never liked statistics, even though you know, I was an electrical engineer and I had to do a lot of math, statistics, I didn't like it. Uh, it never quite rung true with me. And I'm here to tell you, you don't have to know anything about statistics. <laughs> because statisticians are inexpensive to hire. And that's what you do, okay? You hire somebody that really is an expert in the area. So if you're like me and you wanna participate in this sort of stuff, you don't necessarily need to worry so much. There are experts to help you and they're very inexpensive. So let's jump back to the hair max. I put the words hair max into the clinicaltrials.gov website and look what I get. Well, they did five studies and I didn't research these very carefully, but um, I clicked on the first one, which was pretty comical. Uh, they enrolled 33 patients. Uh, 
nine of them dropped out, which right there should probably declassify it as credi credible. But um, it turns out in the end, they, uh, you know, the standard deviation was so high that uh, nothing could be determined from this original study. Um, now, they did other studies, okay? So I'm not trying to say that, you know, <laughs> they didn't show something, but I have a lot of doubts uh, about this. Um, when you go into the FD, the clinicaltrials.gov website, very important information is revealed. In, in, this, in, in another study, they, they enrolled 79 people. They claim it was randomized, randomized, double blind. How do you do that with a device that's lighting up? The patient's gonna know whether the thing is, anyway, they must've done it somehow. It seems specious to me, but they did it. Now, the other thing that's interesting is to enroll 79 patients, it took them a year. That's pretty ugly. That's pretty poor performance, but it's real. And that's something to sober yourself up with is how long does it take to do a trial? Look at what someone else did. Now, in this case, you know, they didn't exactly go to Duke, Emory, and uh, UCSF. Uh, I, I don't know who these people are. Uh, I mean, they're obviously maybe the dermatologists. I don't know. But one of the things I love about this website is you can see who the investigators are and you can call them. I have my students do this regularly and you ask them, well, you know, how did the trial go? Should, if we're going to do a similar trial, you know, what would you recommend we do differently? This is how you learn and you get smart. You follow what someone else has done. You learn from their experience. Okay. Now I'm gonna move on quickly to digital health. Um, so as, as I'm sure you're aware, the wearables are, are amazing in this area right now. Everybody's making watches and all sorts of bands and uh, electrodes to monitor this and that. However, there also are a, a number of disease-based applications, you know, that are attempting to, you know, help maybe sometimes uh, uh, give information and maybe sometimes trying to engage a patient to, to make them do their follow-up activities. And then there's another group of things, and in that category, you have, uh, you know, uh, work that tries to predict what's gonna happen to someone so that you can intervene before uh, things go badly. Now, the regulatory landscape for this is confusing and it's changing. So you're gonna, you're gonna see this is a little bit of a shaky area. And what happened was when Joe Biden in his last days of office uh, under Obama, um, you know, he pushed forward this 21st Century Cures Act. And the idea was to accelerate medical related developments. And in that legislation, it forced the agency to write two policy papers. And here's the links for those policy papers. If you read those policy papers, you will know as much as anyone about this topic. They're long, and I'm gonna just give you the highlights of what the scenario seems to be. First of all, in general, the agency doesn't wanna deal with this category. Generally, it's not a medical device. So when anything is used for only personal health monitoring purposes, it's not a medical device. If something is not intended for use by a physician for diagnosis or treatment, it's not a medical device. And I'm gonna show you some interesting situations here where people put that label on their device, even though it's a good, otherwise good device. And there's reasons for that that we'll talk about. Let's take the Apple Watch. This is probably one of the best examples uh, that you can find. So, um, by the way, I had an Apple Watch and um, 
it broke. Uh, the battery went bad and I tried to change it myself thinking I could do it and I blew it up. And I didn't want to spend another $400 to get an Apple watch. So I went to Alibaba and I bought two really cheap Chinese watches. And it turns out that when I had them on my wrist and it was reading my, my, my pulse, one time I took it off and I put it up against a door, a wooden door. It read the same number. Okay, so the quality of these different devices are wildly different. Now, Apple has done a, I would say, almost heroic job, and they got an actual clearance as a class two device for an over-the-counter claim. And what they were able to uh, show was that with their single lead uh, sinus rhythm, they could pick out when somebody was having atrial fibrillation. Uh, you know, handy, handy thing. But in their labeling is the are these qualifications. First, do not take any action without consulting with a healthcare professional. Second, it's not intended to replace traditional diagnosis or provide diagnosis, even though that's what their study proved, that they could do this. And third, which I found most humorous, not intended for people with AF. Now, the only reason I can think that these qualifications were made is some of them might have come from the agency, but I think it was Apple that put these in because Apple is a very large company and people like to sue very large companies. So I think they didn't want to, they, they didn't want to stick their toe too far into the healthcare waters here, okay? Now, that doesn't mean other people, unlike Apple, are unwilling to do so. For example, here's another company, AliveCore, and, you know, this company, you put your fingers on two spots and it gives you a very good ECG and it can automatically detect three arrhythmias. And look at their labeling. Their labeling is very impressive intended for use by healthcare professionals, patients with known, whoops, or suspected heart conditions. <laughs> so there are companies that have mobile devices that have credible indications for use and are regularly being used by physicians for long-term monitoring. But they had to do a lot of work to get this. It wasn't something that was done with a, a trivial submission. The last category I wanna mention has to do with predictive analytics. Um, and there's many things happening in this space. Obviously uh, payors, uh, you know, serve a certain population and they like to understand what kind of risk that population presents to them. And so people are doing algorithms to assess that. Um, predictive analytics are also used for risk scoring for different diseases based upon certain symptomatology or certain presentations. Um, why do people invent these predictive things? Well, one of the reasons is you'd like to avoid a readmission. If you're a hospital and you discharge someone, you don't want the person bouncing back because you get fined these days. Medicare will fine you and there are some hospitals that have paid millions of dollars for what's called readmissions. Also, uh, like for example, uh, Emory has uh, invented a pretty interesting uh, uh, algorithm that's built into the EMR system that can predict, I think it's like 18 to 24 hours ahead of time when a patient that's in the hospital is gonna become septic. Well, that's pretty valuable because if somebody's tagged at at risk for sepsis, you start hitting them with all kinds of antibiotics to prevent that. You don't want that. That's a hospital acquired infection. And you know, you're gonna pay for that. You, no, no one's gonna reimburse you extra for that. And of course, in the genetics area, there's all kinds of predictions going on. So this is this gets a little bit convoluted, but 
This is the definition of clinical and patient decision support software that's in those policy papers. The first is if you're messing around with a medical image, you know, um, it's a medical device, okay? It's not some kind of, you know, decision support system. It is a medical device. Now, if it's just intended for displaying, analyzing, or reproducing something that is produced by another medical device, it's, you have to prove that it's doing so accurately, but it's more, it's not a medical device. It's more of a quality assurance analysis that has to be done, a validation that you're accurately transposing the information from one system to another. For example, EMR systems, they're not medical devices, but they also have to have a quality system if they're transposing data from other instruments. The instruments themselves are medical devices, but the transposition is not necessarily viewed as a medical device. You still have to do something similar to it. Okay, now, if the purpose is just to provide supporting information and recommendations, you know, like WebMD, well, that's a clinical support thing, a patient information website, that's not a medical device, okay? And lastly, and the most convoluted one, is if your program permits the healthcare professional to independently review the basis for your recommendations, okay? which is kind of curious, uh, so that it's not the intent for the healthcare professional to primarily rely on your recommendation, it's a CDS, a clinical support system, and it's not a medical device. So what a lot of people do to get around this is they publish a lot of information. Like if you're gonna claim that somebody's septic, you put down some other information that the person can look at that allows them to independently agree or disagree with it and not just follow the recommendation. So this is a slippery thing. I figure, you know, some lawyer spent a, a month or two writing this sentence. It's very convoluted. But generally speaking, these aren't medical devices. It depends on how aggressive, you know, another thing they say about, about medical regulation is um, you gotta prove what you claim. So if you wanna claim you're doing X, you gotta prove it. And a lot of times people have a very vague labeling and that's, that's to walk the line around further engagement with the agency, more complicated research that has to be done to back up the claim. Hey Rich, this is Cindy. And yeah. I wanted to make you aware of the time. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, it looks like it's about uh, 1225 oh. and um, so I just wanted to make you aware in case you wanted okay. to. I'm pretty much done, I think. Um, you know, um, I, I just wanna show this last slide and then I think we can, we can stop. Um, the thing is, if you're gonna make a CDS product, despite the fact that I've taught you how it's not a medical device, I think you're nuts if you don't <laughs> treat it <laughs> somewhat like a medical device because if people are using it and they in any way rely on it, you're liable. And so I think, for example, you have to validate that the data you've put into your device will work not only at the institution from which you've gathered the data, but will work at another site. So I think there's, if you really wanna get into the business of making a predictive analytic, you gotta, I think for liability reasons alone, you need to treat it uh, like a kind of medical device or at least comply with FDA software quality management system. Okay, so I'm not gonna talk about reimbursement. I think we'll stop sharing. And why don't we take some questions? Great. Um, okay, um, our first uh, question is from uh, Judd Reddy. Um, Actually, it's a long question. I'm not sure if... Uh, can I see it? If I... Maybe I can yeah. read it. 
uh, oh. under the Q and A. Yeah. Do you see it? Uh, well, where should I look? Down oh. um, uh, on the bottom of the screen, it says uh, Q and A. You just click on it. Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. So and I help translate this. The goal of this document is to outline the intent to propose exempting. Yeah, well, that's, you know, what I covered under the clinical um, decision support is their first initiative to walk away from regulating things. And, and part of the reason they continue to do this um, is that things have gone wild. You know, all of the app related things that have come out, they can't handle it. So if it doesn't look like it, they're gonna hurt any, you're, you're gonna hurt anybody, then you're off the hook. Um, I don't know what easy scrub is exactly, you know, so it's a little hard for me to, you know, Judd Reddy's got a lot of questions here, a lot of things. <laughs> Maybe, maybe we could deal with it offline somehow, okay? Um, um, basically, if you take the process I've used and you can find something similar to your product and figure out your classification code, you can figure out, uh, like if you know what LKB is, all you gotta do is type into Google FDA classification code LKB and you'll see the definition of it, whatever that is. You'll see the definition of it um, and you can take it from there. And there's another site called 510K uh, Clearances. If you type in the product classification code into that website, they'll punch out everyone, everyone who's had an approval in that category. And you can see all the companies that are listed there. Okay, I can, I can give you the website for that if you want. Um, so that's how I would answer your question, okay? The best, the best I can do with that. Um, do we have something else, uh, Cindy? Um, it uh, doesn't look like it. Um, I have a question. So Rich, you talked a lot about uh, what to do when there is a predicate device right. um, for med medical devices. Um, can you comment a little bit on uh, what do you do when you have a technology and you're navigating a completely new path? Right. Well, the first thing you do is try to find a predicate uh, because it'll keep you in class two and maybe your, your requirements will be lessened. And what can happen when you can't get the right match between technology and indication range is you can get them to make a new classification and it's called de novo 510k. And that's a place to begin, to send information to the agency to argue that, look, my thing is pretty similar to this and I'm working on a related application. I can't find a perfect predicate. Can you make a new classification for me, but it, it be a class two because I'm so similar to the other thing. And then, you know, that's better than a PMA, you know, which is the class three. Now, if it's really novel and you can't argue application and um, technology similarity, then you're going to be in a PMA and there's not much you can do about it. Um, does that help? Yes. I can't talk much about that and, because it's yeah. a little bit of a and, wrinkle. And for our folks that are developing therapeutics and drugs, um, I would imagine that uh, that would be a whole other topic. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And also, where do diagnostics fall? Um, is that a, or would that considered a medical? Are, are interesting in that they, if you make an instrument that makes a diagnosis, then it's a medical device and it'll get classified with a product code and you'll have to do whatever you have to do. But if you're a clinical lab and you invent your own test <laughs> for something uh, and you quote unquote validate that within your lab, 
then you comply with the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act and you don't have to get an approval for that. Mm. So it depends whether you're the maker of the instrument providing information or whether you're a lab doing your own testing of one sort or another. And you can even be using different instruments and coming up with your own diagnosis. It's permitted, mm. okay? It's a weird thing. It's called the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act and clinical labs can be credentialed and it's a quality management thing. It's saying, if you've validated that this test is good or equivalent, then you can do it and we're not gonna tell you otherwise. And you don't have to get in, you know, I mean, there is an inspection for the Clinical Laboratory Improvement Act that you can get yourself credentialed by an independent group. And, you know, probably they come and check your quality management system, but, you know, that's a lot of that is being done. And all this genetic testing and, you know, prediction, you know, that's, <laughs> that's all in that domain right now. It's not a medical device. Rich, we have a question here from Anna uh, Quiroga. Uh, what are the CDS, what are the classifications and approval requirements? I'm not sure I understand the question, but um, does that, do you understand that, Rich, what she's asking? I don't know what CDS. Well, I, I kind of went. I kind of went over that the best I could. Um, it depends what you're doing, and it depends what you want to claim. Um, if you want to claim that you can predict sepsis, for example, then, and you're expecting people to use that and respond to it, without providing them the benefit of other information that they could review so that they could independently make a judgment and not just rely on that, um, you know, you're going to be a medical device, okay? <laughs> you're going to be a class two medical device. But a lot of the way people get around that is to provide information that allows a healthcare professional to not solely rely on what your prediction is is indicating and that's that's the key differentiator it's 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 foggy okay i mean you know i told you i think a lawyer spent four weeks writing that you know it's a foggy thing um and it's because the agency doesn't want to get into this people are inventing and hospitals have had you know <laughs> when you think about it right hospitals have checklists they invent their own ways of deciding on this and the agency didn't want to start regulating that. So that's their way of walking around uh, the issue. The main thing to remember is the way not to get in trouble is be careful what you claim and what you put on your website. If you claim something, you have to have proved it. If you don't do that, you're going to get into trouble for sure. And there's plenty of companies that have done have gotten into trouble by thinking they didn't have to talk to the agency and making wild claims. If the clinician selects one of the options offered by the software, is it not a device? You know, sometimes I feel like a lawyer. You know, if you ask a lawyer a question, what the answer always is, it depends. <laughs> That's what lawyers will say. So it depends what software the, the physician was using. I mean, if the software gives them a bunch of options and they just decide to look at all of them and then act on this one, it's not a medical device. If the software only posts this number, then I think, you know, you got a problem. And that's why a lot of software provides augmentative information against, for example, the Emory sepsis system. I, I did a little work on that some time ago. They'll say, this guy is gonna be septic, okay? But they'll also put a lot of other information, trended information about the patient, which typically is what a physician would use to declare somebody's heading for sepsis. So even though they post an answer, 
they have all this other information available and they can kind of get around it being a medical device. However, as I've also said, it doesn't matter. For liability reasons, if you're gonna commercially offer that software, you had better have a quality system, be able to upgrade the software, be able to prove that, hey, it worked on the Emory patients, but I also did a trial run on your historical data from your hospital and it worked there also. So, you know, it's not FDA that's the problem. It's our passion for suing people that's the problem, I think, and why it would make someone behave a little bit differently. Hypertension platform for patients. They use a blood pressure monitor. It's already FDA approved. Upload readings, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Not a medical device. <laughs> because you're, you know, if they're using an instrument that's already FDA cleared, then all your app is doing is asking them to put it in or connect to it in some way. And I, I think it's not, you know, it's not a medical device. Um, all right, well, thank you so much, Rich, for oh, your presentation sure. time today. We really appreciate it. All righty, take care. Okay, bye-bye. Bye now.